world. Um, <laughs> our 16 followers. I'm Naomi, and uh, welcome to Sporty Spice Podcast, where we talk about diversity in sports and uh, how to leave our footprint out here. So, Rachel, and just take it pure away. rage. Oh, pure yeah, rage. It's always rage. Pure rage all the time. But I'm Rachel, and speaking of rage, I hate daylight savings oh and I God. hate spring because, first of all. I don't want another hour with that hideous yellow thing in the sky. Secondly, it's another hour of the day to hate myself. And third, I am allergic to everything outside. (laughs) Literally everything outside. During the spring, I cannot leave my house without getting a nosebleed. It's terrible. It's really bad. But I am very excited because we have another Team USA competitor here today. We are doing so good. We are doing so good. Automatically, it'd be doing so well. Yeah, okay, but like, okay. shut up. <laughs> Eliana is a former Team USA competitive ice dancer. Um, super unique. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that and your journey through that sport? Yeah. Um, do we want like a short recap or the long whole spiel? Up to you. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> Yiddish word there. <laughs> so I guess like medium length way. Um, I started skating when I was four years old and I was also doing rhythmic gymnastics, ballet, ballroom dancing and Latin dancing, just overall very active child. And then at the age of 10, um, I had the opportunity to start skating with a partner in ice dancing, which was in Washington, D.C. So at 10, I moved with my mom across the country. The rest of my family stayed in California, which is where I'm from. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I lived in D.C. for five years. That's when I first got on Team USA. And after that point, my partner retired so I had the opportunity to look for another partner and that's when I decided to move to Michigan to train with uh, one of the best coaches in the world and my last skating partner so we were there for another five years and that's where we really excelled through the ranks of Team USA and we got fourth at Junior Worlds we started traveling internationally to Grand Prix competitions you know competing against the now like Olympic champions and second and third place athletes um and we became the 2018 Olympic alternates and the 2018 world's alternates so yeah it's just been a, a long time I skated for 18 years total and then when my partner retired I had the chance of either trying to push through again or what I decided to do was just go on to the next chapter of my life and see if I can help athletes now from a different perspective rather than being on that side. Yeah, that's really awesome. I mean, I think that Rachel and I, though potentially not as high of a level, we like have a very similar experience. You know, I grew up my whole life playing soccer and I know Rachel did the same thing, playing hockey at pretty competitive levels. And at this point, we're kind of past it. And so we're finding literally any other way. to (laughs) Well out of our prime. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Now that we're washed up, we're like, how can I still be involved in my sport? This thing that I love and probably the only thing that I'm really good at, but from a different angle. Um, so I know that I looked at, like I stalked your Instagram real quick. And I also As just want to throw in there how Eliana and I know each other, which is we went to high school together here in DC. So during her time here, I was also here, which is where I grew up and still live. Um, where was I? Oh yeah. Other things on your Instagram page. Um, so I saw that you did something, um, the women in athletics series. Um, and I was like really interested about that. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I started it last summer. Um, and essentially it was like a passion project of mine because I saw a lot of my fellow female figure skaters specifically were coming out talking about how they had, um, either anorexia or just like eating problems and, what I realized was that like I wasn't even shocked knowing that like five or more of my girlfriends came out with this and it was just so normal and it doesn't even seem like a problem when you're on the inside because you're surrounded by like 10 people going through the same thing the same environment it's just the norm and being from the outside and especially going through my degree in kinesiology and I had a sports uh, psychology class and I was like this is 
burnout. This is an eating disorder. This is completely wrong. How, how are we not doing anything about this? So I started Women in Athletics just to try and get the word out a from athletes themselves so that they have a platform to share their own stories and other athletes can learn from them, learn from their mistakes, see what they did right, and also talk with different healthcare professionals so that they can give their two cents from a very educated perspective. And um, so athletes can hear from them because a lot of times you don't know who you should be looking for for help, especially if let's say there's a 15 year old female whose coach is telling her she looks a little heavy is she a gonna go look for a nutritionist a dietitian does she know who that is or b is she gonna stop eating carbs and go on some crazy instagram diet so if at least there's a podcast a resource i made a website with a list of different places you can look for help um maybe that will at least give her some help or hearing from an athlete that she looks up to telling you know this is wrong like i did the same thing and i had bad results so I'm just trying to promote change out here. You're doing amazing. Yeah. And that's definitely something that's a big issue, especially in sports that like figure skating, gymnastics. And for the one year that I did ballet when I was 16 and hated every second of it, it was just like, it was so, so focused on being a twig. And it's like a lot of ballerinas also have eating disorders, but like sports like this definitely harbor that kind of attitude towards it. And it's just kind of swept under the rug as something that's part of the sport. And yeah, you're definitely right. It definitely is not normal at all. Like a 15 year old should not be seeing their counting calories, you know, like just, it's sad, but I'm really, really glad to hear that you've taken the initiative to spread the word and help people because it's really important. And it's definitely important to make the change. Right. And I think that that's not only something that is in gymnastics and in ice dancing or you know figure skating I think that that spans across all women's sports because or just you know, women in general <laughs> yeah women in general <laughs> you definitely see it in sports like there's a specific body type that a lot of female soccer players have um and that is you know like the big legs like I still have them um, like you, your body is not going to be what you know an Instagram model is and it's really confusing like I have a lot of friends who went off to play soccer professionally or even just you know went to play d1 somewhere and they, for the life of them, like don't understand why their body doesn't look like a stick figure when they their body is built now for playing soccer. And they're like very confused as to how that is the case and why they don't look like that. And I think just building this awareness and giving resources is you know incredibly helpful for that. Yeah, I think one of the big problems is that at least with like figure skating and I'm sure like you mentioned soccer, um, when for us, the sport is so aesthetic. It's all based around how you look. So from there, there's the disconnect because aesthetically you want someone to look like a ballerina, like a model in a sense, but you still need optimal performance. So you need the muscle in the right places because you need to get through a program. You need to do what you're supposed to do in order to place well. So it's confusing because it's like, well, do you want me to look good in a picture, but perform badly or not have the energy to do what I can to my best abilities? Or do you want me to like, maybe look a little heavier, but win first place? Like you can't be both in sports like that. And so I guess the same thing could be said in soccer. I mean, do you want me, am I supposed to look good like off the field or am I here to like do what I'm supposed to do and be the best player out there? Right. Yeah. You see, in hockey, I was lucky. You know, you can't tell anyone's shape whatsoever when they have all that gear on. But um, humble plug once again, second pod in a row, dare to make history by the Lamoro twins. They, um, after they won gold, I believe it was, or maybe it was before they won gold. I, I, I don't remember, but um, they had a bunch of the USA women's hockey players do ESPN body. And like one of their main takeaways from it was none of us look the same. Like we all have completely different body types and it's normal, especially because you're peak athletes, you're elite athletes. You should not necessarily be a stick figure, especially in sports like figure skating, soccer, hockey, you need those leg muscles. Like you can't have like those skinny ass little twig legs like you need your tree trunks you need them like 
You right. can't jump well if you don't have those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that it's also important to realize that if you have skinny legs, that's also fine. I think yeah. all we're trying to say here is that all body sizes and shapes are normal, should be accepted, and that shouldn't affect like your coaches should never be telling you to change the shape that your body naturally is. Um, and like, I, I personally don't have experience with that because as goalies, mostly we're like a little bit bigger than the rest, at least from my experience, a little bit taller, a little bit stronger and you don't get a lot of judgment there. But I definitely saw a lot of my teammates, you know, struggle with this ideal image versus like you were saying, peak performance. And uh, I'm glad that we're working on ways to make that a more talked about and acceptable thing to uh, bring into our conversations. So um, I had another question for you, but I don't know if you guys are done talking about this. What do you think? Should we move on? Um, I, I can add one more thing to that. Um, yeah. And it's from the perspective of like a strength and conditioning um, professional, because while I will say, of course, all body types are accepted, there is a difference between a bigger person with lean muscle and an athlete that is out of shape and does need to change their body fat percentage and gain muscle. So from there, it's really about wording. If a coach says to you, like, you look a little big, you have to evaluate yourself. Am I big because I just have a lot of muscle and I'm in shape? Or do I maybe need to speak to my off-ice trainer or um, a nutritionist and dial in a good plan so that I can lose some weight, but in a healthy manner. So that's just the other point. Yeah. To bring up. That's also something that we talk a lot about. Like language really makes a huge difference in really any context. Like, yeah, like it's important to remember that hey, maybe I look bigger because I'm stronger. Like doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not doing the right thing or I'm not getting the results I want, but so yeah, I, the language is definitely really important and it's something that transcends even outside of sports. And yeah, it's, it's something that I feel like we as a society need, need to be more cognizant of, but it's also, you know, a little bit difficult to just like stop in the middle of your sentence. You're like, wait a second. No, that's not right. But yeah, no, it definitely needs to be a norm with just changing your language because language like that can really hurt someone's self-esteem and really hurt the way they look at themselves. And it's really important to keep that self-esteem while still, you know, like encouraging correct behavior. Yeah, absolutely. So Eliana, I also saw that you have a company called Sustainable Sports Alliance that I now follow and I'm very excited about. So is that kind of the same themes as the other one or is this a new direction? Um, yes and no. So there's no podcast. Um, and this is solely going to be between me and my partner. Her name is Allie. She was also a figure skater. And essentially, we're trying to be the professionals. So rather than me being like the mediator or the interviewer, um, we're going to be the ones providing advice for athletes. So we're trying to travel to different rinks, providing health and fitness seminars. Um, so we're going to have an educational seminar, which just goes over the basics of anatomy, physiology, nutrition, sports psychology. And it's going to be for coaches, um, athletes, and parents. And I think the big thing to mention is coaches and parents, because a lot of times people just focus on the athletes. But if they don't have the right support system around them, or if people are still telling them incorrect things or not understanding what it's like from the athlete's perspective, then there's really gonna be no help. Um, and then my friend is gonna provide functional movement screens, and then I'm gonna host a workout class and we might see where else it goes from there. But the other big thing that we're really trying to focus with this SSA is focusing on athletes that are not elite level yet because with my experience with team usa once you do get to that level you have uh, a list of healthcare professionals i had free nutritionists i got free sports psychology classes um, when i went to the olympic training center we had a big champs camp with a lot of seminars but there was really nothing tailored to that time until i got to that level and i think as you're growing up that's where a lot of you know, eating disorders, sports psychology, like mental health problems can show up 
So if you don't take care of athletes when they're younger and you just try and bombard them with all these things when they're at the high level, then you're facing an athlete with like 10 different problems that has 10 years of bad experiences and it's so hard to break that stuff. So we want to try and give those athletes too the help that they need so that they can have the right tools to get them to the elite level. And then when they get there, they're like, actually, I'm okay. Like, I just need maintenance. I don't need like emergency care for all these problems. That is so, I didn't even realize that. That is so cool. That's, That's awesome. a good spot to be filling. I, I didn't even realize that those things weren't available. Um, and what I think is really interesting is that you think about physical skills like within your sport that you need to start at a young age to be able to do them when you're older. So like if you learn how to dribble a soccer ball when you're four, then when you get older, you're always going to know how to dribble a soccer ball. But we never think about that with our mental health. And that's something that I think really needs to change in our society because that is just as important, if not more important than what you're putting out onto the field, onto the rink, ice, ice rink. Ice, yeah. yeah. Ice, <laughs> that one. Um, yeah, I just think that it's really important to be emphasizing these things, you know, starting when you're younger, so you realize it's okay to have these issues. A lot of people are struggling with this and it's totally acceptable. Um, and just, you know, move on from there. Not only that, but also like, it's hard to reach that elite level if you don't have like this mindset and the health in order and everything like that. Cause like if you have an eating disorder, you're not necessarily going to have the amount of energy you need to put in to rise through the ranks and keep improving so that's awesome to hear that you're doing that that's amazing Thanks. that really is yeah and when I had my um, sports psychology class and we got to like one of the last chapters was about burnout and overtraining and I was just like me <laughs> that's what I had I was like I couldn't like I could never pinpoint what it was but like towards my last like couple months of skating I would just get on the ice and like uncontrollably cry like I just like didn't know what was happening, but like my emotions would just take over. I was like, I'm just so unhappy. I was tired all the time. I would come home and I just want to sleep. Like weekends, I wouldn't move off the couch. I just sit there watching TV. Like I was just so, so burnt out. And it wasn't until I read a textbook that I was like, huh, that's literally what I had. So like, I just think the more people that know what like the signs and symptoms of burnout and overtraining are and how to like periodize a program so that you don't get there, the better off we will all be because I wish like younger me knew all this information. Dude, me too. I was just, I related so hard with that. Probably about the time I was a junior in high school, I was looking to play, you know, at all these D1 schools, but I would be on my way to practice and I would just cry. I had no idea what was going on. And I was like, I don't want to be there. I'm not having fun anymore. I'm at this level where like nothing I do is good enough. Um, I just feel like there's really nowhere to go from here, but this is the only thing that I know how to do. And I thought that I was crazy. I was like, no one understands what I'm going through. This must be just me. Something is wrong with me that I'm having these feelings. And it's very comforting, even like currently to know that a lot of other people are like, you know, you play the same sport every day for 16 Ever. years and um you're gonna lose your shit eventually because <laughs> yeah, it's not even presented like exactly like that all the time yeah. like I just remember being on the ice at like 16 and I was just like like I would my coach would scream at me like pay attention Rachel and I'm like uh oh, I'm here but not mentally <laughs> like but yeah. And like, I didn't even realize that that could have been connected at the time. I was just, and it upset me too. Cause I was like, I'm so passionate about this. Am I losing my passion? Like, is this falling through my fingers? Am I done? Like, is this the end of Rachel and hockey? And yeah, it's like a really upsetting thing to have to experience, especially because like Naomi said, like you spend so long doing this, you don't really know what your life is like without it. And it's a scary thing to like think about your life without this thing that's been in it. And it's been a constant for ever. Right. And I, I know that when I went to college, all of my teammates wanted to go play D1. I think maybe one or two of them went D3. But I was definitely the only one on my team who didn't go on to play Division One soccer. Um, and I went and I tried out for the club team at Wisconsin. And I, I didn't love it. It wasn't a great fit. So I quit like two weeks in. Um, and I just remember thinking like, now what, 
what in the world am I supposed to do? Because this is the only thing I like and it's the only thing I'm good at. So naturally I found a different way to still play soccer, um, which would be with communication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that. Um, have you found transitioning away from ice dancing to be easy or like what are some of the things that you do now that, I mean, I know you're still approaching it from the like outside, but how, how did you make that transition? Like, tell me about that time period. So even, um, I would say from like the last two years that I was still skating, I had a really great strength and conditioning coach who ultimately convinced me just through like the way he worked with us that I wanted to go into kinesiology. Um, and I had so many ideas as I do now, but back then I felt like I just want to do something, but I don't have the qualifications. Like I don't have a bachelor's. There's nothing that I can do, but I was like, I, I want to do this and this, and it was all related to kinesiology. So as soon as I decided that I wasn't going to skate any longer, I went like full steam ahead, changed my direction. I do really well when I set up a plan. I'm like very meticulous with like my planning, even like, you know, months or years in advance, like I have everything set up in my mind. And when I don't feel like there's a direction, that's where I get lost. But I like automatically rerouted myself. I was like, we're going to go get a degree. We're going to get into school. So I just like immerse myself completely in that. And I have been on that train ever since. And it was only really until I graduated and I was like, okay, now what? That's where I felt like a little stuck. I started having a bunch of dreams about skating and I was like, oh my God, like, do I miss it now? Like it took me three years to finally be like, I think I like want to do something with skating again. So now I'm rerouting myself again, trying to pursue a different avenue. Um, yeah, for me, I didn't really feel like it was like, oh my God, like I'm so, so devastated. There's no future for me because I knew that there was something else I was passionate about. And I think the same, this, the same thing can go for anyone is like, as long as you know what you like to do, you have so many opportunities. Like you said, like you love soccer and now you're approaching it from a different way. You just have to see that like, this is your future. This is your new you. And you just have to find the right way to get into it. And I bet that you get that drive where you're like, this is my goal. I'm going to accomplish it from sports. Because oh, yeah. I know that a lot of my friends who were competitive athletes in high school found college to be a lot easier than the other my other friends because they understand the way that you have to make your schedule to fit everything in and like I remember when I was training more competitively it was like you have soccer practice from then to then and then you know it's an hour away and so you have to like fit your schedule around that so I, I definitely can see that that's how you got to to where you are now yeah I also feel like it's like something that's very noticeable to other athletes when someone had like you can just look at someone you're like they definitely grew up playing sports like it's not even just like the way that they interact with you or the way they build their skin it's like the way they carry themselves are different it's too thing. it's a confidence yeah thing. yeah like you can like I just remember walking around University of Minnesota one of my fr like I hadn't I wasn't friends with him at the time but he just comes up to me goes do you play sports and I was like I don't know anyone here. Who are you? Like, and I was like, yes. And he was like, oh, I could tell. And I was just like, oh, is, is this our conversation? Like, is this how I meet you? And he was just like, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, what do you mean? He was like, well, like, if you look around, like, athletes carry themselves completely differently. And it's just like the way they approach the world is different. And it's interesting to see the way athletes apply that kind of confidence and, you know, just the way that they organize things to their lives. Like you said, like with organizing classes and, you know, still keeping yourself in shape and stuff like that. It's definitely interesting. And also like with the fact that like, yeah, like being an athlete instills a lot of competition into you and, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be really com competitive and could definitely help you a lot with like your future and your goals for sure. It's just, yeah. yeah, it's really interesting to think about that. <laughs> when I was uh, going to BCC, my schedule was crazy because I would skate in the morning, then I would go to school and then I would skate again. So a lot of the times I would only do my homework in the car. 
Um, I would like take naps in the car between practice and school. Um, and it was just so, it was so much. And I was like, if I can get like good grades, then like going just to uni is fine. Like I have nothing else to do. Like I better do a good job, which I did. So I was like, good because hell yeah, way less. I feel like for me, when I don't have anything to do because I was so conditioned for so many years growing up playing soccer, like I need that schedule. I need that regimen. So for me, when I have a bunch of free time, I get really anxious. It makes me really uncomfortable. So like I have to go now and I kind of, I make to-do lists every day, like a crazy person. This is, these are my to-do lists right here. Don't look at the notes on them. They're weird. Um, but I need like, you know, every day you're going to lift every day. You're going to do like, so I, without that structure, I like really struggle. And I, that's something I got from sports. And I, I think we get a lot from sports as much as we complain about like the burnout and you know everything that came with that I think that there are so many things that we get from sports too that I also want to talk about and focus on like for me like being good with that structure and and having a busy schedule and still making everything work I think that's probably my biggest like takeaway from from soccer what do you think that yours was Eliana? Um, Yeah I would definitely say it's a lot of drive, determination, perseverance, planning, um, especially like, you know, when you're injured and you still have to do your thing and compete in that sense, like everything else in life is so much easier because I mean, your body is not in so much physical pain. So all these obstacles, like you can get through it. Yeah. And if you could wake up at 3 a.m. to get ice time, you could do anything. (laughs) I remember you like leaving school early and like whatever. And I was always like, how does she do that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was nice that I got to I got out of P.E. and I think like one of the elective classes. But I was like, honestly, like no one even knows me at this school. I'm just like here and there. I'm just like floating. Just popping in and out. Yeah, I'm just like. (laughs) <laughs> people knew you they did know you as the girl that did ice dancing but they knew you. <laughs> yeah, it's it better like, than I can say <laughs> yeah it's, like, it's fine like I'm just I'm literally just here to like get it over with because at that point like skating was my number one like I moved cross country for this I better do a good job so that's why I, like for me I never went to like any school activities because I was like like it doesn't really matter like I'm gonna go travel internationally and like go look at a different country so like I'm okay (laughs) it's like I didn't come here to make friends I came here to win (laughs) kind of but like lower than that (laughs) the next step below (laughs) yeah like a little less extreme but like the same the same fair enough so what are your like future plans I know that you have SSA and you have the the women in athletics but what are your next steps? grad school I was gonna say I know you're going to grad school like where are you looking what's next for you um so my original plan was to go pursue a doctorate in physical therapy um I'm still not entirely sure about that because you know as life is you can't really be sure and my first passion was strength and conditioning um so I I want to try and like experience that before I go into something else um so I'm hoping just to stick around with SSA and see what I can accomplish through there and if I can really grow it into like my own company and brand then I would love to just pursue that for as long as I can um I've been looking at uh sports management masters though uh potentially an MBA or something along those lines too I honestly have no idea and I was actually just emailing my professors for letters of recommendation for sports management school and they were like oh so you you're not doing TPT anymore and I was like like yeah um I, I changed my mind and I was like I hope that's okay and they're like yeah absolutely like we're not judging like it's totally understandable and I was like okay thank god because like I feel like I'm gonna ask them for like three more letters of recommendation or something <laughs> I feel like they're used to it though. You know, like I think a lot of people change their mind a couple of times. I think I changed my major six times in college. 
Um, and you still graduated on time. That's impressive. That's really impressive. I took an extra summer, but we're not counting that. Um, yeah, no, I think that it's great that there are so many different things that you're interested in. That's so much better than not being interested in anything, right? There are so many different things that you think you'd be happy in. And I mean, I think that's all we could ever wish for, for anyone. (laughs) Yeah. And especially with you, like, um, creating your own brand and stuff like that, it definitely helps with incorporating all of those things that you really like. And, you know, it kind of gives you a platform to not necessarily have to make an immediate decision on what you want to pursue full time so to say. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. And even like outside of the field of kinesiology, I I love interior design. I was considering doing a bachelor's in, in interior design at the time. I love real estate. I would potentially look into doing that. I love animals. So I had this one goal um, a long time ago that I was going to live on a farm and just rescue a bunch of dogs and like have my own dog rescue. And I've thought about the same thing. (laughs) Yeah. So that's also like, maybe I'll do all of that as well. Um, I honestly have no idea. We'll just see where life takes me. Just take over the old friend senior dog sanctuary. (laughs) I love that thing so much. (laughs) Have you heard of um, woofing? It's like living on a farm somewhere and they like, do you remember Paula from high school? Yeah. So yeah, she's like one of my best friends um, and her brother went to go woof in Hawaii. So he's living on Verb. I don't know why. I think it's an acronym, but like I couldn't tell you what the acronym is, but he's living on a farm right now and he like works for five hours a day and then has the rest of his day to do whatever he wants in Hawaii. And like his housing and his food is paid for. So like if you, and I think he's doing it for like six months. So if you want to live on a farm for six months, I'll put you guys in touch. You can figure it out. I don't know if there's dogs. I'll ask if there's dogs. I'm good with horses. <laughs> oh, we've got a horse girl here. <laughs> oh no, we're not. We're, she's not a horse girl. Not that there's anything wrong with horse girls. This is a horse girl safe zone. <laughs> I I was. I mean, I was, I am the horse girl. The first toy that I ever picked out when I was little was a horse. I think I counted when I was little. I had like a hundred something horse toys in my house. Like that is me. I am that's amazing. Everyone that's obsessed. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> you still have any of them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I'm not in like my childhood bedroom, but like if you walk in there, it's like walk down memory lane. It's a little cringy, but. It's okay. It's just like horses everywhere on every single surface. You're joking, but I'm not. Yes. <laughs> but like knobs on my dresser have horses on them. Like, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh my God. That's so good. <laughs> Teach their own. I think when I tried the bedroom, had, it was just covered in soccer things. Like I had a soccer ball beanbag chair. Um, my rug was like turf. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) just casual turf in the bedroom you never know when you're gonna have a 1v1 match (laughs) my bedroom was not big enough for that but um yeah I don't know I feel like because I've been in your bedroom it's like there's a lot of hockey stuff oh me (laughs) yeah this is my childhood bedroom (laughs) I just like (laughs) didn't make that connection immediately I was like well she could be talking to either of us when she's (laughs) in my head like I'm looking at you on the zoom so I'm like she knows that I'm talking to her but I'm processing now that that's not how that works so (laughs) I have some uh some skates hanging up in my old room too oh yeah mine are collecting dust in my closet right now (laughs) kind of makes me sad I'll bust them out one day I'll bust them out I'll bust them out how is your knee Rachel it's it's decent it's actually functional for the first time in four years it's great it's great you know it's mostly metal at this point but oh God, what happened oh I just destroyed it I destroyed it I had three knee surgeries over the course of four years and the PRP injection um yeah that was not fun I see I'm not the type of person who gets like freaked out by needles or anything but I damn near fainted getting that shot because the needle was like this big I got 
straight into the kneecap. Yeah, I got the PRP in my ankle and I was like, That's crazy. Did it help you? No. No. (laughs) You see, for me, I felt like a little bit of a difference, but it wasn't enough to like completely negate the need for surgery. Yeah, I don't know if my difference was from the actual shot or I took two months off like during that time to let it heal. So yeah, I couldn't say. What, what are some of your like worst injuries? Is that one of it? Did you hurt your ankle? Yeah, surprisingly, like the worst thing I've had is just tendonitis, but my tendonitis is just very persistent. I don't know if it was for you with hockey, but I had lace bite. Um, I had lace bite on both ankles, which is basically like tendonitis on the anterior tibia. Um, and it's been to the point where now, like I haven't skated for three years and I'll like go on a walk and it like still aches. Like I, I did a good one on her. Um, I had tendonitis in both knees and then I just messed up a shoulder doing push-ups incorrectly when I was little and that's been hurting for seven years now. We're just going to be arthritic messes by the time we're 30. (laughs) We're going to be 30 with walkers. (laughs) Dude, I was on a walk yesterday and like so I turned my MCL playing soccer and MCLs are supposed to self-heal so like I didn't actually need I mean I, I that's don't what mine did it, I need, but yeah um so I didn't get surgery or anything it was supposed to self-heal I like waited the correct amount of time I used crutches whatever that was three years ago now and when I walk it hurts so I it's like definitely time to, to fix that but um <laughs> maybe Just I feel like all of these injuries that I got from soccer like I have bad ankles I have bad knees. My hips are all messed up. I just be like, this is who I am now. This is what I got from soccer for, yeah. It does give us a sixth sense though. We can always tell when it's going to rain. It's like, <laughs> ooh, my knee does not feel good. It must rain sometime today. <laughs> not, you are not the first person to tell me that. Like I have friends who also said that, but like my knee doesn't do that. I think it's because oh, you're does metal. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> probably <laughs> mine's just like all metal. metal. Yeah. I like go to the airport and I'm like just a heads up my knee is completely metal so you know, it's like a 50 50 thing for me I either get patted down or I'm fine <laughs> I do that with my abs when I go through the airport security I'm like oh yeah sorry don't mind my abs <laughs> abs of steel <laughs> shut up I hate you just stop <laughs> me. That was pretty I'm good. surprised I mean I don't know a lot about MCL I know more ACL but ligaments heal very slowly because they don't have a lot of blood flow supply so it's kind of surprising like again I don't know if surgery isn't like what they usually do but in my mind I would think like you would do surgery on that for your LCL PCL and ACLs you do surgery um mine I don't know I like went to a doctor obviously to get it diagnosed yeah like so when it happened because I told you like I did two years of kinesiology I was like I just tore my MCL (laughs) <laughs> and then like I went to the doctor in that exact like, tone MCL. and I was like oh and I was I was upsettingly proud that I knew <laughs> like I should have been more upset but instead I was just like oh my I knew it like, <laughs> I knew it I was right <laughs> yeah you see I probably would have been a lot more messed up if I didn't end up having to go to my school doctor for kidney stones because I was there and I Not even my first bout with kidney stones, might that be said. Um, But I was there and I, I, it just takes me forever to pee, to be honest. (laughs) And I was sitting there for four hours, just chugging water. And they're like, well, while we're here, why can't you walk? Like, why do you have a brace on your knee? I'm like, oh yeah, like two months ago, I just destroyed it. And I've just been walking on it ever since. And they're like, what like are you out of your mind I'm like yeah just a little bit (laughs) I feel like that's something else that athletes do they just minimize their injuries like or just go back way too quickly because I remember I sprained my ankle and I had a high ankle sprain which is like worse than you know a normal ankle sprain and then I had nationals two weeks later and I played (laughs) of course there's There's no other option like you you can't not go so it's like am I gonna go to a doctor and they're gonna just tell me to take two weeks off and I'm gonna nod and walk out and be like no way or (laughs) am I gonna like downplay it and try and suck it up get through and then maybe if I have like an off season I can get some help but still like when they say two weeks off I'm like no 
You mean like one day <laughs> off? It's also we like a few hours. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this appointment just took like all the time I need off yeah. of it. But I feel like there's also like kind of that feeling like you have a commitment to your team and like you can't let them down, even though I'm sure they'd be very upset to hear that you're injured and you're playing. But it's just like, yeah, it's something you know, one of the damn things about sports, they just really instill that in you. They're like, yeah, team becomes before comes before you, you know, even if you're hurt, you got to boot and rally, especially in sports like ours, where it's very heavy on your body. And it's just like, you're just kind of expected to just be used to the pain and just get over it and walk it off. Yeah. Um, my yeah. computer's about to die, so I'm about to get my charger. I'll be right back. <laughs> at least once in an episode Naomi gets up and walks out of the frame <laughs> I'm coming back <laughs> in the second one she got up grabbed a beer <laughs> then came back I needed, I needed it I don't remember what we were talking about that was the rage episode <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> that was completely justified we were like ripping our hair out by the end of that Oh, Lordy. It was bad. Why are you raging? I have the memory of a goldfish. Was it something about so like women? Like the way we ended was like the like we had to like cut it off because we were talking about like applying for jobs and just knowing that the jobs are going to these like white pasty men who <laughs> probably aren't as good as we are. <laughs> um, but you know they're men, so they know more about sports, I guess. <laughs> Do you ever feel that way in um, ice dancing? Because I guess it was usually like a man and a woman, right? Yeah, well, it is, it's very, um, I don't want to say sexist, but I want to say sexist um, because the way that like my coaches and everyone talks about it is like the woman is just supposed to look pretty and the man is like the man and the man has to lead. It's like, I was always like very strong in my presence and my coach would be like, stop leading. Like you have to let him lead. And I was like, well, he's not stepping up. So are we just both not supposed to lead? Um, and like the woman's like the picture and the man is the frame, like that kind of rhetoric, which like- Naomi's <laughs> face. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm literally, I'm trying not to show emotion right now. And I was like having an issue. <laughs> I just it's not like, it's bad, but- it's not so bothersome because I was just like, okay, whatever. Like you're just explaining it that way, but I'm still going to go out there and like, I have a job to do and I'm going to perform my best. So it's not so bad other than like rhetoric, like, because you're both a team, you're both equals. Like there's, there's not much more than that. And even like when you're in singles, when you have like your, your ladies and your men, it's kind of the same men just have like a longer program because, you know, physiologically they're stronger bigger hearts bigger vo2 max like bigger lungs that's fine i'd rather not do a long program like them so i think in the actual sport itself it's like pretty fair i feel like also a lot of that comes with like its connection to ballroom dancing like you know oh, like yeah. it's like yeah like it's always like oh yeah like the lady gently puts her hand in the man's and just does what he does and tries not to step on his feet I, that just reminded me of the movie. Um, oh my gosh, what is it with Will Ferrell and Ice Dance? Blades of Glory. Blades of Glory. Such a good movie. <laughs> I love that movie. You see, I want to be at the point in my career where I could be like Jim Lampley and be in like movies like that, just like as a sports commentator <laughs> for just the dumbest thing on the planet. <laughs> I I stand Jim Lampley. I love him. I love him. <laughs> I love him so much. Do you think that we could have a woman, woman, or a man, man pair? That's my next cue. Um, I, it would be very difficult in the sense that in pairs and in ice dance, there's lifts and it's even hard already for like the boys to lift the girls in the way that like how complicated the lifts are. So just like body wise, I wouldn't like recommend it um, <laughs> but there is I mean in ballroom dancing there are competitions where like if a girl doesn't have a partner she can dance with another girl that girl just has to like dress in like man's clothing um 
So I think it could potentially be done, but more in like the singles or like lower levels where the girls are just trying to go through testing before they find a partner. I'm not really sure if like in the competitive realm, that would be something that they would consider. That's too bad. I could really imagine that movie and... <laughs> <laughs> just the fair. Aerosmith song. Every single time I hear it, I just see the fire in the ice every single time. <laughs> just really into Will Ferrell. I like won't even pretend. I think he's the best actor you of the generation. I already know my dad is going to text me the second he hears you say that because he's going to be like, oh, I hate Will Ferrell. I don't think he's funny. <laughs> like, my dad is a very strong stance against Will Ferrell for some Elf? reason. He thinks he likes Elf. He does like Elf. <laughs> well, I but mean, like he's like has all these exceptions. I'm like, so it sounds like you like Will Ferrell. And he's like, <laughs> no, I don't like Will Ferrell. I'm like, yeah, okay, Dad. <laughs> I'm, just, like, I'm just saying, like, growing up as a nice Jewish girl, I didn't like a lot of Christmas movies, but I, I got <laughs> Elf. Jewish. Elf made sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah, especially growing up in New York, I was just like, yeah, I could see how someone would respond to New York that way. <laughs> Any visuals. Um, I am going to go to sleep because it's 8 p.m. Um, and I work, you know, super early, like at 9 a.m. Um, <laughs> oh, how do you do it? Yeah, Eliana's just out here waking up at 4 a.m. when she's like 12 to get ice time. <laughs> literally <laughs> okay, let me just say that that's like, the craziest thing about children children can get up earlier so like it's a flex and it's impressive but now that i am middle-aged i cannot do <laughs> middle-aged <laughs> quarter life crazy too she's not even quarter <laughs> i also just want to throw out there that i normally don't work at 9 a.m this is the first time i've worked at 9 a.m in a really long time so <laughs> you have to mentally Wait, I, actually, okay. I do exactly I do. I did have one more question. Oh boy, all right, question. all right, full stand, last one. So I know you talk a lot about CBD and stuff like that, and it's definitely starting to make its way more into like the public eye and the field of sports. But, you know, do you think that it's ever going to get to the point where like, instead of, you know, <clears throat> constantly just like prescribing a ridiculous amount of opioids, that you're going to be like, hey, why don't you... uh maybe try some CBD that might help you out a little bit more without, you know, the consequences that come with like the craziness of opioids and painkillers and all that stuff. I think in general, I'm, um, I'm going more into like holistic medicine. Um, so I am trying to find like different avenues of healing yourself with either essential oils or CBD or herbs. Um, natural foods are great I think it's difficult when you like I don't know in what uh I guess like topic you were talking about because like in sports let's say if like you're injured like CBD I don't think is going to do anything like right it's, it's not going to heal like your broken average, wrist <laughs> if you're an average person and you have like a little ache or like some inflammation like maybe it'll do a good job but um with athletes that are like taking pain medications I don't really know what other like alternatives there are because like I not that I was like on anything stronger than Advil but like for um my ankle started hurting before junior worlds and I was popping I got a cortisone shot didn't do anything I changed my skates didn't do anything I was so much I was popping like six Advils every like couple hours like I just couldn't take it um stomach (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah so now that's why I'm like trying to find some more holistic ways so I honestly have no idea like it's great for the average person I would say go for it <laughs> yeah no I was just interested in that because like people are so quick to prescribe like painkillers and opioids and stuff like that and amazing absolutely <laughs> fantastic but um you know like personally like I my body does not react well to painkillers like I had been put on so many painkillers after every single surgery and I'm just like a child and I'm like you should this probably doesn't seem like the best idea to be giving a literal child (laughs) like but yeah and it's definitely like a big issue in this country and yeah Yeah. I was just curious what your thoughts on were on it in terms of you know supplementing more harmful drugs for CBD yeah I mean there's there's no harm like there's no THC 
I don't think you can overdose on CBD. It's only going to have positive effects of like uh, reducing inflammation and like neurological stuff, like mental health help. Um, so yeah, I mean, why not? I have bought CBD for my cat because he has anxiety. <laughs> I give my dog CBD too. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So, I mean, I think it's fine. That's so funny. Yeah. I take I take CBD before I go to sleep. Um, apparently, if you like put it under your tongue, it helps you fall asleep. And then if you swallow it right away, then it helps you stay asleep. Hmm. So I do both. I just need to drink a whole, whole bottle then. <laughs> like it's annoying because it's pretty expensive and it's like well at that point why wouldn't I just smoke weed because it's cheaper but I can see how one would prefer CBD um in other ways like if they're getting drug tested so definitely a big advocate of CBD yes I agree it's very helpful in a lot of senses especially with my metal knee <laughs> actually though. and the no cushioning no cartilage in my knee <laughs> ouch <laughs> yeah it's rough I can't even kneel I like can't kneel anymore it's just awful Every although time granted that's about- a very easily avoidable thing to do <laughs> every time I think about your knee I get upset um yeah right you should see the pictures of it <laughs> I don't want to yeah no you don't <laughs> Eliana thank you very much for joining yes. us Thank you so much, Eliana. It was a pleasure. It was a great time. And to all of our viewers, a good night. <laughs> all three of our viewers. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thanks so much.